Good evening. Welcome to this virtual conversation about the book Murder in the Garment District, The Grip of Organized Crime the decline of, and the decline of labor in the United States, which was published just days ago uh, by the New Press. My name is Joe McCartan. I'm professor of history at Georgetown University and executive director of the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor. This evening, I have the pleasure of moderating a discussion with the book's two authors, Penn State Harrisburg Professor of History and American Studies, David Whitwer, and Catherine Rios, an award-winning filmmaker and writer, and Penn State Harrisburg Associate Professor of Humanities and Communications. This program is one in an ongoing series offered by the Brooklyn Historical Society, which has been a cultural hub for civic dialogue and community engagement for 155 years, for over 155 years. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with the publisher of the New Press. Before getting started tonight, I want to invite those listening to share your questions with us. Please type them into the Q&A box you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We'll take some of these uh, in the second uh, part of our program. And we anticipate the overall discussion today will last about an hour. I also want to mention that the book is available at, uh, on, at a discount on the website bookshop.org. We'll put a link to bookshop.org in the chat box uh, of this Zoom call for your convenience. So look for it there. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the authors, David Whitwer and Catherine Rios. David and Catherine, welcome. You're muted, I think. Hi, Joe. Hello. <laughs> there you go. We got it. Welcome to Zoom world, right? Yeah. Um, it's wonderful to have this time with both of you. And uh, as I understand it, this is your first book event since the publication of your book. I bet you didn't anticipate uh, that you'd be doing events like this uh, online when you um, got ready for this book to come out. No, that wasn't that wasn't the expectation. <laughs> wasn't part of our vision. However, we we like the idea of being able to reach such a wide audience using voice. That's a wonderful aspect of these calls and and these opportunities. And so, all the more because you have such an exciting and, and interesting book to talk to folks about. You know, when people ask me about this book, um, I find it hard to describe because it's one part murder mystery, it's one part labor history. Uh -oh. uh, an astonishingly good read, um, and uh, I couldn't recommend it more highly. I, I was hoping that you both could help uh, set the scene for the folks who are listening tonight by talking a little bit about how you open the book. Okay. Uh, and that is with the discussion of a murder, a murder of a labor organizer named uh, William Lurie. Uh, and a little bit about that murder and, and how it helped set the stage. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe. And uh, thank you for, for moderating. And I also want to thank the Brooklyn Historical Society for, uh, for working with our publisher, The New Press, to do this. We, we really appreciate this opportunity. And we also want to say a big thank you to the audience too. This, uh, this is an exciting opportunity for us to share the, the stuff about our book. So yes, the, the book opens with a, with a murder uh, in May 1949 um, in the heart of the garment district, which was one of the crowded industrial districts in, in New York City. People still know the garment district today, right? You can go through Midtown Manhattan and you can see it, but, but you know, back then it was very much part of the sort of industrial center of New York and the murder happened in the middle of the day in a crowded section. Will Lurie was an organizer for the largest union in New York City, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. And the women's uh, dress industry was the largest industry in New York City. And basically he was working to organize non-union shops on West 35th Street. He stopped into a phone booth in the, in the one of the buildings right there on, on 35th Street, and two people came and uh, 
attacked him in the phone booth, stabbed him, uh, and uh, and uh, he sort of staggered out onto the sidewalk and collapsed uh, in the street right there. And uh, at the time, this was uh, a major event, right? This sort of attack in broad daylight uh, in, the, in one of the busiest sectors of, of New York City, it was a signal people took at the time of the power of organized crime and the threat of organized crime. And we use that opening segment in the book to sort of talk about the threat that that even well-established labor unions like the International Ladies Garment Workers Union face from the power of organized crime in that area. And that action was such a, an overt, you know, call um, within that industry, within that community. We kind of could start the whole story by just asking what, what was the message they, that was being sent with this action? Um, since it wasn't just an isolated event that was, you know, a, a target for a, vic, for a crime, you commit the crime, everybody. Maybe within an ecosystem. And we wanted to unravel that. So what message was sent by that murder? How did people see it when it first happened? And then once you started to get into the story behind the murder, how did that reveal to you a whole world of dynamics that was going on in the post-war period? Well, so the message that was sent, and this is the way the union understood it. We, we came across a memo in the union record. The message that was sent was the power and the impunity of, of organized crime in this setting, that they could stage this sort of attack and that they knew that they would get away with it. And, uh, and so the union at this point, it, it doesn't, it comes not to see that the state can protect it. And so they, they can't depend on the police to protect the union. They can't depend on the district attorney to bring justice. And in fact, no one is ever convicted for this crime. And that fact that they can't turn to, to the state for protection, then that leads, that leads this union, and we would argue by extension, other unions in the same situation, to have to make an accommodation with organized crime. In this case. And we argue in the long run, that leaves segments of the labor movement compromised, vulnerable to to criticism and political attack. At this moment, um, labor is a rising force, right, coming out of the war, um, where unions have become a power as never before, representing maybe a third of workers. Um, and so a lot was at stake in regard to the movement in terms of what power it would have in the post-war era. How does this murder and the, the failure of the state to really protect the union figure into the struggle that was going on about what role labor would play in the post-war era? Well, we like to argue that, you know, the, labor at this point is in a very contradictory position and, and the International Lady Garment Workers Union, which is led by David Dubinsky, is a kind of classic, a classic example of that ambiguous position. On the one hand, as you point out, Labor comes out of World War II, having organized a third of the a third of the workforce in the union. By the late 1950s, unions have reached their all-time peak, and people like David Dubinsky, the head of the Garment Workers Union, are politically quite prominent. Right, just a, just a year before this attack takes place, really just six months before this attack takes place, Harry Truman campaigns in New York City alongside David Dubinsky. He's a key part of the Democratic Party coalition, and so they have political power. They have economic power, and yet they're still quite vulnerable, right? The, the issue is Dubinsky can't protect his organizers. He can't protect his union officials. Uh, and, and it's that ambiguous position. We look at another union leader in the same period, um, uh, Walter Ruther, who's the head of the United Auto Workers Union. In some ways, he's in an equivalent position, right? He's, he's a power in the CIO. He's quite prominent in Democratic Party politics. But at about the same period that Lurie is killed, there's a series of attempts to murder Walter Ruther, and he gets no satisfaction from the local Detroit police. He gets no protection from the FBI. The only reason that he's able to sort of keep fending off organized crime in Detroit is that he has more resources and he's able to hire essentially a small army of private security to protect him. Mm. The story you're telling here seems to be one that counters what a lot of people, I think, think um, in a kind of peripheral way about the union movement in this period. One is that it was just a power, a power, big labor, 
And yet what you're pointing out is that even at the moment when unions were big labor, if, if they ever were, they still were quite vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and still lacked state protection. The other um, thing is that many people believe that the union movement and organized crime were sort of deeply entangled with each other. And it seems to me what you both show is the way in which to the extent that entanglements did happen, very often they happened out of defensiveness because unions didn't have protection. Is, is that the right way to think of it? Yeah, I, yeah I, I think that's exactly right, right? I think that the standard stereotypical view, right, is that unions in this period make a bargain with the devil for power. And so you have the you have this nefarious view of, of labor leaders maybe drawn from on the waterfront or the most negative depictions of Jimmy Hoffa, of someone who's made a bargain with organized crime like you would make a bargain with the devil, and therefore they've lost all control. But what we found was a quite different story in terms of the Garment Workers Union and the Garment District in New York. There what we found were well-intentioned labor leaders who uh, made limited accommodation with organized crime and organized crime connected employers associations. And they did that to organize the industry and to bring real benefits for their membership. And that accommodation didn't mean that they signed away their role as a, as a, as a well-intentioned union. And I think um, one, one facet of the story that I found fascinating was the complexity of all of the factions that were at interplay, all vying for control, all vying for power. And, and what we what we learned was just how complex those intersections were, and and you know when you have so many different angles all aiming, you know there were so many different ways to benefit and profit from this industry, and I think that um, you know to portray the union's relationship with organized crime as as kind of this dominant element of of the garment industry at that time was just one slice of the story, one facet of the story that that really communicated, um, you know, it supported an agenda that uh, really wasn't about the workers at all. So I, I feel like the story itself was so complex and there were so many different factions of the story all vying for control. And there was, there was a lot to be gained and a lot to be lost by each of them, by each of those factions. So from my perspective, there, there's just a ton of tension of these different groups within this, uh, within this, economy all vying you know for control and for part of that um part of the profit there i think what you know you use the word complexity cat and i think that that that's something that really comes out of this narrative that things are not what they seem that they're a little more complicated very often and that this is time and again something that one encounters in your book one of the places i think where you really see this is in your account of a really notorious story, one that might be well known to anybody who knows um, about the labor movement and issues of corruption in the late 40s and 50s. And that's the story of a columnist named Victor Riesel, um, who became known for writing columns um, exposing union corruption and who at one point suffered a, a really brutal attack. He was blinded by acid being thrown in his face. Um, and the way that story has been told over time uh, has been that of course this was done by people who objected to the columns Victor was writing uh, that might've been done by union people or mob people at union behest. But you probed into some of the FBI files behind that case and came up with some startling findings. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this notorious case and what you found. Yeah, yeah, this is one of the big cases of the 1950s. And it, you know, to the extent that the 1950s become a time when, uh, when labor racketeering uh, draws national attention, it, it's, really, it's, it's really because of the Victor Rizal case, or Rizal case, um, Almost as much as the William Lurley one, like uh, the 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 Riesel the Riesel case spurs congressional hearings in the late 1950s, partly because of the public outrage over it. And the story was that Riesel was a syndicated newspaper columnist who specialized in writing about uh, labor unions. And he'd written uh, he'd written about communist infiltration in unions in the early Cold War period, and then he switched over to also writing about labor racketeering by the mid-1950s and 
he liked to argue that communists were working with organized crime. And I always try to imagine what kind of restaurant they would go to when they were fired. But, but he was very, he was very well known as kind of a hard hitting, um, I, I always think of him as like a Mickey Spillane kind of writer, like a, a no holds barred kind of writer. That's how he was described at the time. Yep, yep. And then, uh, mm. and then in, uh, in April 1956, he was, he was leaving one of the Broadway restaurants, uh, you know, and uh, with a party of people after he'd made a radio broadcast. And someone stepped up to him and threw a vial of acid right into his face. And um, it blinded him. So he was hospitalized for several weeks. And as soon as, as soon as he was able to address the public, he adopted, uh, he adopted the, uh, he adopted the role of martyr. And he said that he had been attacked because of his crusading anti-racketeering policy. And that was the widespread assumption at the time. Uh, and then within a few months, the FBI tracked down essentially uh, the group of people who were responsible for the attack. Uh, and they were tied to Italian organized crime, uh, and they were tied to what was a notorious mobster of the day, a guy named John Diaguardi, who's known by the nickname Johnny Dio. And then uh, at the trial for Johnny Dio, the, the case collapsed because the co-conspirators were essentially too terrified to testify. And at the time, that was seen as the as a sign of the real power of Lake of carrying it in, in organized crime. I think Life magazine says they could defy the federal government. And that's the standard story. And then when, excuse me, when we looked at it, we, we ordered the FBI files and it takes quite a while for you to get them. Uh, and nobody had ever gotten that case file before. And within the first, say, 200 pages of those FBI files, it turns out the FBI found out things that were quite different. And so Riesel at the time and in the press at the time had said that he'd been attacked because he was cooperating with the federal grand jury. In fact, he had nothing to do with any federal grand jury. He hadn't testified uh, before a federal grand jury. He had no intention of doing it. Um, he actually wasn't writing anything about labor racketeering and certainly nothing about Johnny Dio that would cause that. And then within a few weeks of their investigation, what the FBI found out was that Riesel was taking money from notorious labor racketeers, organized crime figures who were in unions, and he was taking money to keep them out of the newspaper. Essentially, he was running his own protection store. And far from being a, far from being like an opponent or a crusader against Johnny Dio, there was evidence that they socialized together, that they had uh, that they had been in the same restaurants, that they had that uh, Riesel's uh, mistress and Riesel had traveled on the same plane with uh, with Dio. And, and so it was a quite different story. The FBI knew this, and they never let that information out. Uh, subsequent congressional investigations found out about it. They never kept it. They never let it out. And Riesel himself, of course, always kept that always kept that title of being the, the public victim number one. The martyr. And, was, yeah. and stubbornly attached to that rendition of, of events and interpretation of events as well. And I think in terms of our process, that that moment, that um, uncovering that piece of information was almost like a turnkey in some ways for the, for the larger narrative because this, um, I mean, the story of the story of our book is that, you know, the stories are constructed and um, the Riesel event was like a perfect example of that. There was a, a, a version of the story that, you know, the fact that he didn't even write articles about this particular um, organized criminal was not uh, hiding. This information was not hiding from anybody. It was literally in the newspapers in, in the preceding months and weeks, you know, and years of this attack. Mm. You, could, you could see that. Uh, it was available to anybody who cared to look. And, and I think that that... Um, the, I don't remember if we had a martini or just kind of like a big stunned silence. <laughs> we really put a little money to this because it, it kind of revealed um, this intersection of forces that was lying like an undercurrent of all of these events that we had been struggling to connect because in all of the archival material, there's so much information and there's so many things happening. It took so long just to find some basic patterns that we could then use to develop um, more intricate, you know, observe more in more detail, more subtle connections. And that was a very pivotal moment for our process. Well, it's a real bombshell in this book. Um, and um, one of the things that really blew my mind as I was reading the book, because I read so much about this case and nobody ever suggested anything other than that Victor Riesel was simply a martyr. Um, 
it gives uh, new meaning, I guess, to the phrase fake news <laughs> right, right. in that period, right? Um, now, one of our, our listeners was uh, asking a question related to this, and that is, you know, how did the New York press um, react to the murder at the time? And it seems to me what you're saying is that even though right in their own pages you could find evidence that the Riesel story was more complicated, they really latched on to the Victor Riesel as the um, martyr to, you know, labor's corruption, sort of. Is that, is that right? That's right. You, you get some sense. And uh, I looked at individual newspaper columnists, private papers, and there was a sense, you know, amongst columnists themselves that they, they didn't necessarily see him as, and this is in, in their private correspondence, they didn't necessarily see Riesel as, as the guy that he depicted himself in public. But, but nobody in the, in the press, nobody raises that issue. It's not something that, that becomes questioned. Instead, they really focus on this threat from organized crime and the way in which, you know, Riesel went on Meet the Press really just a few weeks after he got out of the hospital. And one of the things he said was quite powerful was he said, look, if, if organized crime can do this to me, and he's there with these bandages over his eyes, right. like, if they can do this to me, they can do it to anybody. And if they can do it to anybody, then their power is a threat to our nation's security. That's equivalent to the threat that communists would pose. And, and I think that that moment, how quickly um, his, his martyr narrative kind of took hold and became um, the dominant narrative, that happened very fast. And through the Meet the Press, it escalated politically, like almost immediately, like almost immediately this call for action, legislative action. And it, and it, it did result in that. So maybe well, there was momentum there behind that story that just couldn't be held back. Absolutely. And powerful forces had great interest in promoting that kind of view, right? Mm -hmm. um, and including forces in Congress, um, including forces that would ultimately result in the creation of the McClellan Committee investigation in the late 50s of organized crimes, influence on the labor movement. Um, one of the things the book also does is it, it brings up two of the most interesting characters of, of that period in many ways. And one of the most interesting rivalries, that between Robert F. Kennedy and Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, RFK and his role in this story and, and a little bit about Jimmy Hoffa and how he figures into the larger narrative. Yeah. So... So basically, in the wake of the Riesel attack, there's a call for a new set of congressional hearings into labor racketeering at the time. And there'd been smaller investigations throughout the 1950s. Um, but, but this set the stage for a major investigation. And as you note, there's, there's powerful forces pushing for that, right? On the one hand, we're, we're, we're right in the wake of the merger of the Congress of Industrial Organizations and the American Federation of Labor. And so employers associations like the National Association of Manufacturers or the US Chamber of Commerce, they're both quite frightened by the power of labor. And, uh, and I looked at their internal correspondence and they were talking about calling for a public relations campaign that would raise the specter or the menace of union power to the public. But one of the things that they said is when they polled the general public, most people were, they were not that alarmed. They're like, well, that doesn't seem to be that much that, that's dangerous. And so, there's an internal memorandum in which the, the National Association of Manufacturers says is what we need is some kind of investigation that will bring a series of cases that highlight the menace of union power and union violence. Essentially, they needed a congressional investigation. And actually, after the Riesel attack, the National Association of Manufacturers created a pamphlet of Riesel's columns that followed that attack. And they sent that pamphlet to congressmen, uh, all, congressmen all across the country. And then this becomes the justification for these McClellan committee hearings. These are the largest investigations into organized crime or labor act hearing really ever. And certainly one of the largest investigations uh, by Congress after World War II. So mostly people have heard of things like the House on American Activities Committee, or they've heard of Joseph McCarthy's permanent subcommittee of investigations. Those might have 10 or 20 investigators. The McClellan Committee at its peak had 80 investigators on staff. And it went for two and a half so, years, a large-scale investigation. 
Can I, you, this deserves emphasis, I think. Are you saying that the McClellan Committee investigation, and one of our listeners, by the way, wanted to know, is that the committee that was also called the Senate Committee on Improper Activities and yes. Labor and Management? Yes. And that's, that's right. You're saying that their investigative force was even larger than McCarthy's investigative force yes. in, uh, against communism. Yes. So the labor movement and uh, the fear of corruption in it attracted far more attention then you would say then even then communism yeah I, I guess i think that i think if it, that's it, the measure yeah if that's the if measure, that's it, a measure at least in that measure yeah. yeah and there were multiple as you know there were multiple committees in congress in sure but there were multiple committees looking at labor opportunities as well sure but uh, oh, i'm sorry uh, just in terms of uh, you know looking at this material and and i'm a fiction writer so i'm always looking at action and reaction and following the actions and reactions, it was really like, uh, you, it's like a view into the mechanism, into the gearbox, because, you know, these um, um, efforts by NAM to push this agenda and to push this le for this legislation and for the res legislative response, you know, to respond to that pressure, it, it, it's really like this um, gearbox of, of, of coercion. Uh, I mean, mm. it's really fun for a fiction writer. To, to grapple with. Mm -hmm. uh, a tremendous, uh, you know, insight comes from this book about the importance of historical narrative and how narratives can take shape in a time to explain what is going on in that time. And it seems to me what your book does so well is to, to show the power of a narrative that began to emerge, that labor was corrupt, that this was a real threat to the country. Uh, even though in many cases, corruption certainly existed, it was exaggerated in the minds of investigators. Um, and so much energy it was put toward it that it, it even begins to take events like the Riesel murder and fit them into that narrative rather than to see them on their own terms and to see that actually they don't fit very well with that narrative at all. Um, and so the power of narrative um, is really one of the real insights of this book. And it's uh, no coincidence, I think, that, that Kat, you are um, uh, a teacher of writing and literature and um, communications, and you're an award-winning filmmaker. This is a collaboration between a historian and really a narrativist. Um, and I should also say for folks who are tuning in, you're also husband and wife. <laughs> yes. So this was a collaboration of a really uh, intimate and complex sort. And, so yeah, talk a little bit about, you know, first about what it was like to work as a husband and wife to, to put together this, this book. Oh, okay. Well, you know, Dave, David is, is just a, um, an incredibly, dogged researcher. I mean, he's able to unearth material that I just, I'm all constantly astounded. So this has been the backdrop of, of our relationship ever since we met. Um, and when this story started to gain traction, David had just completed um, his book on West, Westbrook Peg Pegler and was kind of circling around a new, um, a new subject and gathering materials. And I, um, the, 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 the richness of the materials that he was finding and just these, at that point, somewhat, in my view, disconnected act, actions and people and different, we were trying to understand what the racket in the, in the garment industry was. It was so complicated, um, but there were so many interesting characters and the setting of the garment industry itself is just like this powerful ecosystem that um, just has so many different elements to explore as a writer. Um, when I took a sabbatical, I had all of, David had, 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 had kind of collected a, the substantial body of work, but I was the one who had the first opportunity to kind of sift through it holistically. So when I went through there, I mean, as a fiction writer, I'm kind of working with um, perhaps a character or an image, and I can use that as a launch pad to explore a theme. But in this experience, in this process, it was more like this huge, complex array of material that I had to kind of sift through to start to identify what themes, how things were connected. And I saw this murder of this union organizer 
um, as being emblematic of something much more complicated. It was, it was like a singular event that represented a very complex system. And then as we continue to develop around that initial thread, um, there, the intersections between all these different events of the story just kept reinforcing that, you know, some central ideas that we're developing. And, um, and I knew that I wanted to, I wanted to land in a place, I wanted to write about people that didn't get uh, represented in these stories in American history and, you know, um, in, even in popular culture and media, we don't see the experience of the workers, we don't see the experience of women. And from my view, I, my screenplay is framed, it's, it's actually framed as a limited series and it launches with the murder and it culminates with the dress strike. But in that cinematic version, we follow the motivations of the people and you know, it's much more gritty down to earth with people. With the historical book, it was, it's the same frame, but it, it provides us with an opportunity to look at this system from multiple angles and through the lens of different stakeholders. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I don't know how it is for you, Joe, but, but for me, research when I'm, when I'm on the book, that's, that's my world. And so yeah. it, it, if you're married to an historian, then you know the historian <laughs> always wants to talk about this stuff and is always digging. And, um, and I think a good spouse will, will be able to listen so far. But to do a, a project where you're both on it together, and uh, and you share the you share the research discoveries. You share the the questions of of what really was going on here, whose motivation was involved. And, and I can remember, you know, our daughter was like three or four, and we would be discussing we would be discussing this particular organized crime figure or this particular businessman in the garment district and his role. And uh, and, uh, and our daughter would chime in and she'd say, you know what I think was going on? I think it was this. And it, it was at that point where I realized it was really very much, it was a historical project, but it was also almost like a, like a family project as well, which was, which was a, a very distinctive and in some ways very fulfilling experience. Mm -hmm. I like to say, like, I, I feel like as a fiction writer, I kind of, I kind of ask, uh, you know, why? And David asks how, and that's an oversimplification. But when we merge those perspectives at looking at the same body of research, it just, um, so many things were, uh, there were just so many moments where we could, our, our perspectives would crystallize around a specific event. And, and, you know, that would be a really key, that would be a really key um, insight that we could develop. And I remember that situation, that, that particular moment with Maren, I believe she was cutting carrots with one of those plastic children's knives that looked incredibly dangerous with this serration and she turned with the knife in her hand uh -uh. This classic knife, and let us know what Hoffa would have done at that moment. <laughs> David, um, having now collaborated with Kat in this way, will this affect your writing going forward in terms of how you tell stories? That's yeah, a really good question. I, I think it will, you know, Catherine always emphasizes uh, issues that, that you don't think, or maybe you do, but I, I wasn't trained to think about them as a historian. And so she'll often say, what's, what's the theme here? What, what theme are we pursuing? And that's not something like historians, we tend to think about, uh, at least I don't so much before this, but, but now I really do. And I, I think theme is another way of getting at some of the issues that we're trained to get at, but it's, it's one with perhaps a, a hook or a, an emphasis that has more to do with the with drawing in a wider readership. And, and, and that's really been, that was our goal with this book was to, was to reach a wider audience. And, and it's one of the, from my point of view, it's, it's one of the things I'd like to do moving forward. So. Um, very good. Um, but let me ask you one question about like the pains to which you had to go in your research. Um, you rely a lot on FOIA requests, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, to get the FBI files, for example. What's that like, and, and how, how difficult is that process? It, it's really quite difficult. To, it, you know, the, the tool itself is really, it's really quite powerful because, you know, when the FBI does an investigation, they throw lots of resources into it, and, uh, and the files can be, can be quite voluminous. But to get them, you know, you file what's called a Freedom of Information Act, but 
But to do that, it, it's sometimes not just the case that you need the name. Like you can't just say, I want Victor Riesel's uh, FOIA file, because what you might get would be just a side file. And so what you need is, oftentimes you need a case number. So you need a specific case name and case number. And so sometimes you do a series of requests just to get that. And then once you get that case number, then it can be an average of three to five years before the request is fulfilled. And what they oftentimes come back to you as, and, and they, they don't mean this nefariously, but they'll say, if you, if you abbreviate your search, if you just ask mm -hmm. for the summary uh, reports, then we can get it to you in say a year or two years. But if you insist on all the reports, then you go in this longer queue because you're asking for more stuff and then it could be four or five years. And it mm -hmm. was. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you know, it's in those detailed reports that come up from the field that you tend to find the stuff that doesn't make it into the public record. And so you have to be patient. And that means, in a sense, you, you file for stuff not knowing when you'll get it and not knowing what's gonna be in it. Mm -hmm. Well, well said. And you know, I think, you know, had you not seen the file on Victor Riesel, you would have had a very different kind of story, it yeah. seems to me. But as Kat was saying, that becomes kind of a pivot to your larger point about the way in which the narrative is being oversimplified. So we have tons of questions from the audience. So I'd like to, to go to some of these uh, now. Uh, I don't think we'll get to all of them because we're getting so many. Um, so one uh, is, how did you encounter this historical event? What inspired you to decide to work on this case study and make it and make a decade commitment to having a revisionist history narration? Mm. That's a great question. Yeah. So I'll say my side and then Catherine will say hers or you could say hers. <laughs> first. No bad. Yeah, so for me, I had just finished a book about a newspaper columnist, uh, Westbrook Tyler, who was an arch conservative uh, who used uh, a union corruption scandal in the early 40s as a way to argue against the rebirth uh, of unions in the, in the New Deal era. And what I started out looking for was the opposite of Westbrook Tiger. So newspaper journalists who were pro-labor, but very much involved uh, in covering labor. And that led me to Riesel, and then that led me to uh, the acid attack, and that led me to the Garment District. And in terms of the Garment District, the, the major sort of big case there was, was Will Lurie's case. Uh, but seeing the connection between Lurie's case and Riesel's, that's, that's something that really came to me, really didn't come to me. That came all from Catherine. That was her framework of thinking of the narrative in that way. Right. So mm -hmm. for me, the, um, the, the murder is, is almost, it's like when I work, I, I'm trying to, it's, almost, it's like a mystery that I have, to, it's a puzzle. I pour all the elements out onto the table and start to sort them out and find a pattern. And once I started seeing, you know, the, the big topic was corruption. And for, for me personally, um, the misuse of corruption to, you know, squash working people is, is like something that I'm personally really invested in. Um, you know, I, I'm, I would like to reveal the mechanism behind there so that we can get over, around it, like we can, it can be utilized um, in a different way. Um, so this, this David's work in, in has always kind of had this element of corruption, which I find really fascinating. But I wanted to dig underneath and um, explore the garment industry and the garment district as a setting. And then um, once we started looking at, for me, once I started exploring the setting of the garment district, which was is so fascinating. And I see a question about fashion designers, which I hopefully I will be able to talk about in a minute. But um, the setting of the garment district, uh, so many complex things are happening, but when I worked backwards, this kind of inciting incident moment was this murder of Will Lurie. It was the moment that was kind of, there had been um, labor violence before and there would be labor violence after, but that moment, his murder was launched a thread of action that culminated in a place where I wanted to land ultimately, which was the 1958 dress strike. One um, uh, listener uh, writes, the focus has been about the corruption within the labor movement, but what was the role of employers in this story? Yeah, that's a really good question. That? 
And that's one of the things that we, we really benefited from in, in this account. I, I wrote a book before this. My, my first book was on corruption in the Teamsters Union. And, uh, and one of the things I was really struck by in that was that, was that there tends to be this sense that uh, when you write about uh, labor corruption, employers are always the victims and unions are always the aggressor. And, and that totally misrepresents the way it works. Uh, and in systems where there's endemic corruption, where it happens again and again and again, uh, that's where a place where what you see is corruption uh, is, is part of an economic system. And, and it's very much tied into things that benefit the employers in that place and time. So in the garment district, we, we have a chapter in the, in the book about the role of corruption within the garment district in terms of employers. And so there what you would have would be very sort of small scale capitalism. So your average garment manufacturer was not this large scale capitalist. They were operating at a narrow margin. And that meant that they were eager to cut corners. And in ways to cut corners, there were different sorts of practices that you might engage in. And one of those practices would be to get yourself uh, an organized crime connection or a partner who would help you to evade the, the union's controls or the union's restrictions. And so there were lots of ways in which employers essentially accepted or embraced the role of organized crime. And that meant for the union, they had to make an accommodation that they wouldn't have had to make if they were dealing with a different set of employers. And so one of the things I mentioned in the file is um, in the in the text is the FBI talks about this in a series of, uh, of their case files in the 50s and they come back to the garment district again in the late 60s, early 70s. And one of the things they say quite boldly in the uh, in one of their case files is we're never going to end corruption in the garment district because employers find the role of organized crime useful. And, and even like, you know, the political will that terms uh, something extortion versus bribery uh, pretty much is that issue, like yeah. whether or not it serves, you know, who, who's controlling, who's controlling the language around the, the action, whether it's called bribery or extortion. Um, yeah, in this case, usually the employers seem to be more aligned with the, the elements of power. <laughs> One of uh, our listeners was asking about the legislation that came out of the McClellan hearings that Bobby Kennedy served as counsel in. Um, and I think that that's a good opportunity for you to talk about the consequences of the narrative that took shape uh, across the 50s. Could you talk a little bit about that law uh, and about some of its legacies? Yeah. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is the way in which once you get the congressional hearings, there's this there's this, um, there's this uh, twist that occurs, which is that they, they have an army of investigators and they, they look in the garment district uh, and they also look uh, in New York in what are called the paper locals, which are these small scale corrupt unions that proliferate in the, in the low wage zone in New York. Uh, and the congressional investigators, we, we had access to the reports and they could describe sort of the reality of what corruption and racketeering was. But when the actual hearings occurred, the hearings became kind of a, a showcase and they parallel in many ways the, the showcase hearings, if you want to, I, I could see a question about McCarthyism in there, the sort of showcase hearings in terms of the communist threat. And so mm -hmm. the McCollum committee came to focus on not so much the mundane realities of how corruption would work and affect the average worker. Instead, they focused on, on Jimmy Hoffa and on a couple other prominent union leaders, but mainly Hoffa and his ties to organized crime. And it became really, the, the hearings became framed as a contest between Robert Kennedy and Jimmy Hoffa. And then this comes to be a depiction in which the, the, the cause of union corruption is powerful union leaders like Jimmy Hoffa. And the way to solve union corruption is to limit the power that's available to leaders like Jimmy Hoffa. And the way to limit the power that's available to people like Jimmy Hoffa is to limit union power. And so Landrum Griffin does do some things in terms of union democracy, but it, its two most effective measures are measures that limit the power of unions. So there's, there's an act which limits the ability of unions to engage in what's called organizational picketing, which is to picket a site where they haven't necessarily converted the workers to members yet. And a second is a limit on secondary uh, boycotts, which is one union helping out another union by refusing, for instance, to make deliveries across the ticket line. And when this law is framed and when they're proposing it and when they pass it, what Congress says is, this is a law that will put Jimmy Hoffa out of business. 
So they frame it as a response to him. And of course, one of the many ironies of the law is, right, after the law is passed, Jimmy Hoffa remains in power. It doesn't actually take away any of his power, but it does hurt lots of smaller unions that were using these tactics to organize or to maintain their industry. And one of the unions that's most severely hampered by it is the International Labor Government Workers Union uh, in their efforts to deal with mobbed up small shops. And I wanted to add to that because I think this is also, this is also an area where the, the design of the narrative has as much to do with the lasting impact of this event and the politics around it and the legislation that resulted from it. And that, you know, right away, even when they were designing the investigation and the hearings for the um, McClellan Committee, they were framing it in this, in this, in exactly this way, aligned with the same kind of framing device that they would use for anti-communist, um, you know, actions. And so it was, it was almost like precast. It could fit into that template, story template, really, really easily, which means that the, you know, the, the depth of, of, of the corruption and the impact on workers and how, how you might, um, how you might actually counter those corrupt forces in a different way. They, they never really emerged in the narrative and they, and they still have it. And I think that that particular framing has been um, deeply entrenched and reinforced through, you know, um, uh, the enemy within uh, Robert Kennedy's book, The Enemy Within, it kind of set that narrative um, in stone and that's been the kind of bottom line narrative ever since. But because that's the only, you know, a convenient way to look at this, all of, you know, this particular story, um, other stories about it have not been, they have not been able to get oxygen. And, and I think like when some questions about how do organizers use this information to help labor organizers now, I mean, you know, ensuring that there um, that there's a fuller representation of of what what elements are at play in some of these um, dynamics is is really key because I think it was um, it really shorted for a long time understanding what the mechanisms were that were at play in this in this corruption and in the you know emergence of union power and the suppression of union power there were a lot more things to examine than just like Jimmy Hoffa's morality, in my view. Right. Um, and just want to underline one, one thing that you all mentioned about the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, the McClellan Act, uh, the prohibition on workers helping each other, one union to another, that really one of the outcomes of, of the narrative that builds in the 50s is laws that weaken work, weaken solidarity, workers' ability to express solidarity with each other. And it seems like in these days, um, today, as we look across the country and the situation we face in the COVID crisis, where workers very often are going to work in dangerous conditions. Um, and, and there have been uh, many uh, instances already of wildcat strikes and walkouts of people demanding PPE and uh, protection from their employers, that the costs of what came out of the story you, you tell in this book so well are becoming really acutely clear in this moment. Um, I'd like to shift our discussion and to talk about some of the implications for today of your story. One of our listeners um, typed in a question earlier about would, would people in the garment district today have something to learn from this story? And I'd like to put that to you and then get you to expand beyond that. What, what does this story have to, to, to share with workers broadly today? But maybe you could begin with the garment workers. Yeah. Hmm. So I think I think the, the story offers a very different understanding of, of the rise and fall of the Garment Workers Union and, and also a very different sort of narrative about uh, about the how we should understand union power. And so I think the implications for today are, you know, one of the things that the story is about in the 1950s is, is this was a moment really uh, of great potential for the labor movement. So, you know, 1959, 1955, the two labor federations merge. Uh, unions are at their all-time peak. And one of the things that I saw when I looked at oral histories from, from union leaders at that time in the 1950s was this real sense that this was the moment that they thought 
They were going to build on the strength they had. They were going to build on, a, on the achievements that labor had had. They saw themselves going forward more and more. And then from their point of view, these series of investigations and the way they spin the issue of union corruption, they end up becoming this barrier, this roadblock to the ability of organized labor to achieve its potential. And so I think, you know, when I look at the situation today, I see some of the same sorts of themes emerge. I think we're looking at this moment where, where there's real potential for the labor movement. The issue of economic inequality is more and more at the forefront here. And now we have Democratic candidates who are much stronger in terms of their support for organized labor. And as you were pointing out in the pandemic, lots of people look at the situation now and they say, if we had stronger unions, as, as they do in Europe, then we would have we would have workers who would be better able to position themselves to stand up for better protection in the workplace. But at this very moment, right, you say the same sort of forces emerge. There's a scandal in the United Auto Workers Union, and it was just really a month ago in the wake of that scandal that you have journals like the Wall Street Journal saying, big labor causes big corruption, and any effort to empower unions, which is what Democrats are doing now, risk this notice of empowering corrupt unions that really are exploiters of workers, not protectors. And, and I guess what I think the lesson for our book is, is you have to look at the way in which that narrative, that, 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 that framing of corruption, which, which, which bends the depiction or mars the depiction of organized labor, that, that hamstrings our ability to, to grow a union movement, even in the best of times. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the story you tell here really has profound implications for the present moment. Um, uh, going back again to the question of narrative and what kind of story are we seeing around us? Um, and uh, I think what your book helps us see all the more clearly, I think, is the importance of putting workers really in the center of this narrative of the present moment. Talk a little bit about how you end your book uh, and why you decided to end it that way. Going back to the end, is this in? Yeah, so we were really struck by, you know, the way in which the understanding of the McConnell Committee hearings is shaped by one particular book, which is Robert Kennedy, as, as Kat mentioned that. Robert Kennedy's The Enemy Within, which he wrote the year after he left being the head of the, of the McConnell Committee, the, the general counsel. But just before he became the Attorney General of the United States, it became a bestseller. And even today, you know, if I go on, um, you know, whatever book site I might go to to look for books. Bookshop.org. <laughs> yeah. And I punch in labor racketeering, that book's going to come up at the very top. And in that book, right, what Kennedy did is he depicted his investigation as the story of an intrepid set of investigators pursuing a nefarious organized crime connected union leader, Jimmy Hoffa. And this becomes the depiction, it becomes essentially a sort of true crime frame, right? That you have heroes and that you have villains. And that, and that the clear villains in this case would be mobbed up union leaders. And the clear heroes, right, would be would be people like Kennedy who would be the investigators or martyrs like Victor Rizal who depicted it that way. And this makes right the, this sort of very moralistic telling of it, this totally eliminates the workers from the narrative. They're not there. And, and you don't read that much about what unions do or what unions could do. They totally disappear. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to sort of talk about that at the very end of the book so people could see the way in which this narrative has been framed for them, even though it doesn't match up to the actual reality of what labor racketeering is. Yeah, I think that's something that our book is very much about is the story of the story. And, um, you know, when you, when you cast it in, in fairly simplistic narrative terms like, like, like the Kennedy book, I'm sure it's a good book, um, it, 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 that re resonated with people as a story. They were going to respond, and this is the, the, you know, true crime does this for people. It's very salacious, and it has powerful characters that do, you know, compelling things, and, um, and you get kind of latched, you get kind of drawn into the story. But in fact, the story is so much more complex, and one of the things that um, I learned from working on this book was um, how much 
the framing of the narrative reveals about the present moment. Like Kennedy's perspective on, on this battle, this feud he had with Hoffa and what this whole issue was about was Kennedy's perspective and he cast it in that way. Um, but what, how we're looking at it reflects more about how, you know, how we can view corruption as, as a, as a, as a, you know, there are conditions for corruption and, and, and it, 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 it's fostered in certain conditions. It's not necessarily driven by personality. It's not necessarily driven by villains and heroes. It's systemic. And so this is, this is the view that we're bringing to those actions and those events of that time to see if, which reflects more of how I think we are thinking about corruption now. Um, at the same time, you know, the Wall Street Journal article is trying to reinforce that narrative, you know, that simplistic narrative that, that's like, you know, unions are bad power, union power is bad because unions are corrupt. Well, really, like how many unions are really corrupt? The, the bigger picture of union organizing and the, the needs and agency of workers is not even represented in that simplistic story. So you're, you, you're just not serving the needs of, um, you know, the working people. So I, and I, and I see it reflected in what's happening now. I think some of the, um, some of the initiatives that I see emerging in response to this particular crisis is that workers are demanding um, a presence and decision-making bodies in their organizations and companies. And I think that's something that a healthy union would provide. Well, I, I think we could talk for another hour very mm -hmm. easily, but um, what we've seen, I think, just from this, how time has flown here, we haven't nearly been able to get to even a fraction of the many wonderful questions that came in. It's just how much this story unearths and, and how, how deep it is. And, and I think the profound gift you've given us with this story is the message that comes out of it of what we lose when workers are silenced and marginalized in our narratives. And that's uh, the story you tell so eloquently in this book is what happened when workers' voices were pushed to the background. Uh, and I can't think of a more important uh, lesson for us at this moment when we think about our essential workers out there. Essential, it seems, in name only because they're essential yet told to go out and sacrifice themselves for everybody else. Uh, this is a really important message for us to take uh, at this time. I want to thank you both for having written such a wonderful book, for inviting me to converse with you uh, about it. I want to remind our audience that Murder in the Garment District is available uh, at the website bookshop.org at a discount. So I encourage folks to go and get the book there. You won't be disappointed. It, it's a page turner, and it's one with some profound lessons. So thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Catherine, so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, we the, the book has a website. It's murderinthegarmentdistrict.com. And on the website, there's a way to s contact us and email us. And if you, if you have a burning question that you really would like to see us um, try to grapple with, please, you know, you're welcome to email us directly at the website. Yeah. Great. And thank you, everybody, for, yeah, thank for you joining so much. us. It's, it's a real pleasure. It really is. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night.